we okay? All right, if I can get everyone's attention, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess those of you in the room, and as well as I believe it's live streamed, so those of you out in the world. Um, so I want to welcome you to this lecture, um, which is part of the School of Design lecture series. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers, uh, Mark Garcia and Itia Poes um, And they're from the design studio, We Question Our Project. Their website lists Itzia's title as Project Brain yeah. and Mark's as Professional Questioner, which sounds great. Uh, makes you really want to understand what it is they do, so we'll learn today. Um, and together with their colleagues, they focus on action-driven service innovation to help public organizations and businesses jointly create and prototype new service concepts with their customers and internal teams. They're based in Barcelona, but their work extends across Europe. Um, and it is in sectors such as health, social services, education, tourism, environment, and mobility. Ethnographic research and co-design approaches are really hallmarks of their work, and they say their pet area is iterative development through prototyping, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, their rich and diverse projects span a spectrum from trying to ease loneliness in elderly citizens to uncovering opportunities for innovation and in patient experiences in children's hospital as well as hacking a hotel ecosystem. Uh, they also take up timely challenges such as how to make face-to-face -face service as agile as social media. Merck and Itzia regularly speak about the role of service design in government and lecture at several design and business schools, including Central St. Martins in London, Alto University in Finland, and the Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And we are very happy to have them here with us today. So please join me in welcoming them. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here. For us, it's like, I don't know, more than a pleasure, like something like we're really proud to be here with you. Hopefully, the things that we're bringing from Europe uh, is are going to, things to be things that really, I don't know, inspire you somehow and give you a clue of what, what we do and what so you can do. Yeah, no? feel interesting and maybe exotic too. Hopefully, at least exotic, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> So, so as yeah. Daphne said, I was going to introduce your company, and but it's everything. It's everything here. I know ev everything you said is right. So well, except for the outdoor thing, we don't teach enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It'd be nice if someone is looking from outdoor. So like really fast, what you already said, our academic uh, academic part of, of the what we do in life. Uh, the central one is related to projects uh, with clients. The only new thing that I want to remark right. is that we're going to be in Canada traveling. So we've been in Europe and. South America, Ecuador, and countries like that, and it's f our first time that we're going to be working in America, in this case in Canada. And of course, this part that is what you said, that conferences and all this, uh, just to remark you really briefly, because some, uh, someone told us that in in Carnegie Mellon, you, you so, or someone organizes the uh, uh, Global Service Jam. Is that right? No. Yeah? No? no attended. You attended, okay. Well, you should yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, we do we do run the Barcelona chapter for uh, one kind of uh, global service jam that is called uh, Global Gob Jam. That it's a service jam uh, tailor made, let's say, for public services. So we really do this kind of workshop that is 24 uh, 28 hours long, and we work mainly. 48 hours. Sorry, 48 hours long. And we work with uh, service design practices and approaches with public servants that they have never been in touch, not even with service design and, of course, not with design. So super fast, yep. only to help. If you want to mention or otherwise? You can. I don't know. There's this book that we always play because we're really proud to make part of this book in terms of that we have a case. We are a really tiny uh, studio. And it Probably it the time. The tiny is in Spain, probably, and we have a case here. So it's not the best w book in the world, but it's really interesting if you want to know a, li a bit more of about service well, design. I mean it's not the best book in the world. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm in Carnegie Mellon, and I cannot say that's the best w book in the world. So let's say it's. <laughs> I don't dare to say it's that. A good it's a good introduction for service yeah. design. 
Yeah, I think so. It's a great introduction, and it's ha it's nice to read it with because it has a theory and practical cases, uh, and we have one case. Super fast, as uh, Daphne said. The only thing is that remark that as, ser as service designers. We have really very different backgrounds and really mixed. So it shall include the thing of the drumming and music. I, w I used to be a professional drummer, but mainly I come. I have a background in design, uh, and I did my MBA studios related to business, and then I went to uh, service design and innovation. And as you can read here, it's just is not a, f a designer, but she's a philosopher. So she comes from this other side. Uh, she is also a translator, so <laughs> he had a career in that, and she started with UX and digital, and then that's the path really, it was really long, but to be brief, she went as me uh, through design thinking and all this. We ended at service design, so just to let you know that you can come from wherever you come and you could have, uh, you so can be a service designer, so. <laughs> so the talk today. I know, you don't need it, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, besides that, maybe you want to also introduce us. So the talk today, yeah, we're we going to explain okay. one real case. Uh, if we have more time, because we can always be very optimistic, maybe we can explain you something else. But most probably it will be just one case. And but and well no, we thought that it's better one, because then you will have time to questions and answers. So I think we, th we think it's worth to have this conversation <laughs> better than only giving like, like you inputs. And yeah. so well that's where we're going to be, showing yeah. you one project, no? And um, we're going to show you a little bit of the theory and perspectives that probably are going to feel like way like simple to you. But this is what we explain to the clients and uh, to basically because we also do like, uh, yeah, and we can skip anything that you already know there and whatever. But I think it's interesting because we're always like in touch with the clients and at least the public ones and, and how do we position service design for them. Uh, so, oh, sorry about this, for some reason. So from that point, I will let, I will leave you with it here because she uh, she was leading the project that we are going to explain. I think it's better that if she that she w explains that to you, and then I'll be back. Yeah? I, thought <laughs> I, thought I had taken away all the slides that weren't belonging to this, but for some reason one appeared. But uh, anyways, we're going to tell you about this case. That is, it's a case that. Uh, we did with the biggest social foundation in in Spain that it's it's a foundation that belongs to a bank but they they do this like more social projects with the extra money that they generate and uh, they work a lot in many other topics but they have an important area of work is with uh, the aging population with the elderly citizens and they have all these centers in neighborhood based where you can go and gather with other old people. And some of the ce well, centers used to be like pretty like simple, just have a bar and a place to hang out and meet all the guys. Uh, but lately, they started understanding that the new old people that we were having, like people who are like 65 now, and then they just retired, they're old, but they don't expect to simply just hang out to a bar and, and meet some people over cards. They were expecting a little bit more. So they started doing all these new programs, some of them related to, I don't know, introducing digital tools or uh, other things. And one of their like biggest thing is health programs. So they have all these courses that they kind of promote health prevention in the old age or help people understand how their body and the way they their it's going to change. <coughs> like for example, they have a program on how sleeping changes as you grow old or things like that. So normally for these programs, they hire a very important, really well-known doctor and this person creates a manual so with all the content. And then there is these guys who are nurses or, or physiotherapists that are the teachers of this courses mm -hmm. throughout their centers. And for this, course, for some reason, they, they had heard about um, people-centered care in, in health, and they thought that maybe this could have something to do with human-centered design or something similar, and this is how we end up creating the course for them. So this program, and our program in particular, was to prevent falls and sarcopenia, and do you guys know what sarcopenia is? And 
probably not. So have you noticed that when people grow older, they start losing muscle and they have like maybe like mm, less strong legs or arms and they start having more problems to move? So this is, this is sarcopenia. It's the loss of uh, muscle and function of the muscles. So we started with this. Um, we started by doing some research, like with all the different actors. By the way, I forgot to say that these centers that the bank has all around, they are uh, managed by associations of or little communities of all people. So they have all these boards that, that manage the center and they get some money, they get the center and then they do whatever they want. So we did all this kind of research that you can probably all know from previous projects, so I don't need to go through a lot. But basically the only thing is that we went into like make sure that we could talk and so and with all the different uh, stakeholders that were around the project. So it would be like the trainers and the old people that were coming to the programs and also the boards that were managing the centers where the programs happened and the people from the foundation and everyone and some experts because we needed to really know what what sarcopenia and falling is about. Uh, so uh, just to highlight a few of the things that maybe are a little different mm -hmm. or maybe not from what you guys do. We did do a number of visualizations including a user journey but often journeys are around the interactions between the person and and the organization somehow. But this journey that we built, this is the interactions with the whole courses. But we did a much broader journey. So like a little bit like an onion with different like layers of information. And it started with when are you aware of being an old person? So this awareness of aging and when, when do you consider yourself or suddenly wake up and say, I'm old. So now I'm, I'm like, f like officially old. And, and how does this change your identity? How the centers that these guys have help you rethink about your identity? How they become a place where you meet all the, not only old people, but older than you, and you learn from others how to be, a, how to age well. <coughs> and then the health courses, and then projections about dependency and, and, and death, and how do you expect for your future? So, I think that's interesting because it kind of extends and it's the whole experience of aging in a way or or maybe not that much but a little bit more broader and what we really like to do with this is not just okay we have the insights but we really share it with the uh, stakeholders and have them understand or decide what is meaningful so make the meaning of what is really the opportunities here, what is interesting, what is that we are not taking into account so far. And some of the key findings, I'm just going to go, in terms of storytelling, I think it's going to be easier if we stick to this two, because the ones that are in bold. Uh, one of the things that we found was that these old guys in Spain, Basically, they spent more than half of their lives in a dictatorship. It was pretty harsh as a life. And what they w really wanted to do as they w retired was to have fun and, and like, yeah, be able to enjoy life for once in my lifetime. It's like now I have my retirement pension and I can be here. I don't need to worry about anything. I don't need to work. I've been working since I was maybe 11 or 15 and this is, Simply, I just want to have fun. Uh, but at the same time, the foundation, so our brief was to make them aware of how falling and not taking care of your own health and not being responsible of uh, making exercise and things like that do affect your health. So the foundation wanted us to have them reflect on this end of life and fragility and all that. So it was a little bit at odds. And at the same time, we noticed that all the guys who were the trainers, they were basically not following the manuals. So there were a number of manuals for the different courses and they went to the course and when they had the people in front of them, if they were better 
uh, trainers, they would just like empathize with them and start talking about something that was most interesting to them, which is great because in terms of experience, it was better. But then at the same time, uh, it was more like, mm, sometimes it was a little crazy because everybody ended up doing courses on nutrition. Because basically, for some reason, old people in Barcelona are really fixated on how they need to eat. Mm -hmm. So all the courses, maybe it was the sleeping course, or maybe it was the gymnastic course, all of them ended up being a nutrition course. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> which is a little bit like, yeah. Uh, so when we had all of this and we had like the stakeholders being more or less uh, agreeing on what was interesting, we um, decided to involve everyone in creating the real course. So this is more or less the process that we followed. So basically we had the participants, so the guys that normally go to the, to the courses and the trainers. Then we had some experts. Actually, we had interviewed a few like four or five experts, but we stick to one that was one of the leading experts in sarcopenia in Europe, and we have had the great pleasure to work with him, especially because not only he was very knowledgeable, but he was like super open and, and very interesting to work with. And then we had the boards and the staff from the foundation. So we wanted to involve everyone in their different capacities in making the course all the decisions about the course. So the big decisions was about the concept, then the content and the calendar, and then there were a few things that were more like, how do we communicate this? How do we organize that were related to other, other stuff that was happening that wasn't that important, but it was key to organize. So what we did initially in our like naiveness of designers, we thought we would just put everyone together and we will do something. But we noticed that there were many tensions and many problems there happening. So it was impossible to just put them together and expect that they wouldn't yeah, end up really pissed off with each other. Mm -hmm. So we decided to split them and do the same or very similar workshops with people in different uh, moments of the day <coughs> and then exchange their uh, results through the expert. So the expert could like give us some tips on, well, this is really like, in health terms, this will work, or in health terms, this is not as interesting, or whatever. That was like, because our goal was to have something that was also working uh, in, in uh, effective as a health course. And so we would like work with the participants, and then the end result of the participants, we would give, them, give it to the trainers. So they would have to start understanding each other's position and by exchanging, start like uh, braiding a little bit the different perspectives into a single course. And only at the end, put everyone like in testing the prototypes together. So just for you to have a sensation of how this worked, this is us working with the old people uh, on, on, the te on the course concept. And these are the trainers working on the, same con on the same course concept. So for the course concept, basically we kind of went a little bit back into what is the experience of each of them. And then we, when we put this together, we asked them to like create basically a poster. So we ended up with a poster that was advertising the course. It was a good way for them to project what was interesting. So I have this question for you. Which of these two posters you think was made by each of the teams? So by the old people or by the trainers? And? Trainers on the left. Trainers here. Everybody agrees with this? Mm -hmm. So you see <laughs> trainers here? And the why, trainers. yeah. Who says trainers is here? Okay, minority. <laughs> Who says trainers is here? Yeah. And anyone care to say why? Go ahead. Uh, the one on the right, the references are older. Yeah. So I would think that seniors would have that sort of standpoint. Um, the one on the left looks like you're training horses, not people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Th we have to repeat it for the streaming. Oh, yeah. I'll repeat this so it can be streamed, your answer. So she said 
that this is in all iconography, so it feels more like some someone more senior has made it. And this is like training uh, horses, not people, so maybe it's more the point of view of the trainers. And maybe you guys who were not agreeing, why not? Or anyone? <laughs> Go ahead. I thought you mentioned like the older people wanting to like be free of responsibilities, mm -hmm. and so that's why I thought the horse on the left it, it has something tranquil about it. Yeah. Good. And what about the other one? What and do you? The other one is kind of like we're going to get in here and work out, and that seems like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that's great because it's in Catalan and you got the meaning perfectly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he's right. That was made by the participants because they wanted to feel like a horse. Like I want, I can't. I'm able to do anything, and it actually says like trotting and running, and we can do everything. So they really wanted to feel free and feel <laughs> like strong. And on the other, yeah, it says maybe microphone. It says, let's try everything. Yes, yeah, like trotting and galloping, I think it's in English. Yeah. It says, trotting and galloping, let's try everything. It's like, oh, let's try everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and here you can read like uh, a strength for the day, daily life. Let's go. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's clearer now, no? Yeah. So not only that, that you're right, and I mean, it's not about, it's that... Also, the old people when, uh, of course, we were crossing the information, and then uh, old people when we mm, show them the the posters that the trainer made for them, they get a bit, let's say, let's say what they think they got. Yeah. 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 What do you think of the reaction? <laughs> 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 yeah. Go yeah. On. yeah. What do? You you say I'm just repeating to for the recording. So, so, so disappointed. By this side, they're saying disappointed. The, the old people or the trainers. The old yeah. people were disappointed. Oh, sorry, the Anything else? Come on, it's not an exam. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Here's. He's yeah. saying that it looks like a stereotype and a cliche. No. Naggy. I don't even know what it means, but it looks yeah. naggy. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds horrible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, th the thing is that actually, other people, they thought that actually th they found it offensive. Yeah. The Popeye poster, they, they were a bit upset. It's like, how are they treating us uh, like kids? We are not kids. And we, we are adults. And, of course, the trainer thought, like, these these guys are crazy. They are, they are completely crazy. They, we cannot let them do whatever they want because they're going to be injured. So there was actually like a kind of the opposite reaction for both. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, also with the Popeye, <laughs> it was a little bit like they're treating us uh, as kids and at the same time as old because it's like super old in time. Yeah. And and the horse one was a little bit like oh we can't let them gallop, but <laughs> but at the same time it was like oh we make them do the gymnastics on a chair, so it's kind of for them it was like a shock and at the same time a little bit like maybe we need to change the yeah, way we was deal. Yeah, was actually with the participants. So we just exchange the thing and get them to do the content and the calendar. So this that you see here we created like all like all type of material so they could create they could create the calendar themselves so they had like different different types of paper for different types of sessions and then they had like these pictures here they were like different types of exercise that you could use so they could just like put everything or discard whatever they thought and all the exercise and things were based on things that would work well in terms of health uh, so basically they started by analyzing, then they read some files on medical criteria, chose the type of session, and then filled the sessions with content. Um, <coughs> if you ever think of replicating this, this idea of choosing the type of session before you fill it with content, this didn't work really well. It was too abstract, uh, for especially for, for some like seniors, for example, these, these men here. He was like so handsome and, and a full gentleman, so everyone wanted to be in his team. Because most of yeah, most of them were women. But <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> but 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 he had real problems in understanding that you can actually like have a session rhythm without understanding what is inside of the session. So this is something that you need to take into account depending on who you're working with. They may have different uh, ways of approaching things that, that are not a problem for you. But it has to be said that also for the trainers it wasn't easy because they're used to training but not to think about a course and create a course. Uh, so yeah, so this is us with six types of calendars, like six full calendars created by someone else trying to merge them into one. Um, this is also a good lesson. Don't do not do this well if you can avoid it because it, it is a long time. <laughs> but it was, it was great and you had there all the very interesting ideas and we were like picking thing, things that were like similar but also things that were salient that were like this is something that nobody else said but it's super interesting. So, but it, it did consume a lot of time. So this is what we got from, from the synthesis of everyone. So basically what they had created was a kind of a, a structure for the course. And, and some of them, the thing is that some of them were like really crazy because it was like, oh, we just want to put everything here. And it would be like, this would be a five hour class. <laughs> and some of them were like, well, today we're just doing Tai Chi. So it would be like maybe with 30 to 45 minutes is enough. So basically what we did was like to make sure that everything would fit the schedule and, and that it had like inputs from like most interesting inputs. Uh, and we merged it into just one that we checked with the doctor and we checked with everyone. And I'm gonna skip also the communication and all that part because yeah, and go directly into the prototyping. So basically this is how we prototype the content. We basically did we the content in a smaller, shorter version, but uh, and we prototyped the basic things that were going to be repeated each day, like the gymnastics, but then also the exercises that were we weren't that sure that how they were going to work, and and things that we had doubts. So here you see them exercising this that looks a little weird. We had gone to the hospital to visit the doctor and then we noticed that they were in the hospital they were using uh, this ankle weights that are great and that you could regulate them and that you could actually have people improve and put them more weight when they were <laughs> like training. And it was like, oh, nobody had told us about this weights before and they are great. So we, we didn't have time to look for them. So we just made them with stockings and some rice. And yeah, this is what they are holding in case you were thinking, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so basically we had them perform their role, but also some other roles. So here, this girl here, for example, is a trainer, but here she's behaving like, like a participant. And some of the participants were also doing our role because they were observing and, and taking notes. And after the end of each exercise, we would have a, like a talk and here, if it plays, yes, it does. Uh, this is called, well, this, you don't hear it, but it's, it's based on Eurythmics. And yeah, nobody here is gonna get this joke, but it's not the, it's not the band. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, um, it's actually a technique that uh, some guy in Switzerland uh, created to, for training, uh, professional musicians so they wouldn't lose the sensibility to play music so they wouldn't become just uh, like so technique oriented but some guys from like some doctors from Switzerland recovered it and applied it to training um, all people not to fall uh, basically it, it's based on just reacting to changing music and following it with your with your body so you are kind of training one thing that is called dual tasking. So basically one of the things why you fall when you become older and you're just walking in the street and you fall, it's because you are not so longer as able to like keep a conversation, for example, and walk at the same time. This is called dual tasking, when you have a task that is cognitive and a task that is physical. So this exercise is great because you have to be hearing and responding to music and at the same time moving. So it's training you and it's making you more able to then 
do that, but I'm going to play it again and tell me what do you see that didn't work really well. They're closing their eyes. Not moving their legs. No, moving their legs, exactly. Yeah, that was like, uh, when we saw it, it was like, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to review all the exercises for, for this, like the eurythmics part, because we needed to force them to move their legs. And, and this is also interesting, because here we had noticed, as I said before, there was a problem and there was a tension between I'm gonna, I want to have fun and you're here coming to tell me that, uh, give me advice on not falling at home, for example. Mm -hmm. And we actually had some people say, when you come and tell me the advice of no, no well, the trainer comes and tells me the advice of n for not falling at home, I feel that he or she's telling me, you're gonna fall, you're gonna fall, you're gonna fall, and I feel terrible. So we wanted to avoid this rejection and we decided to approach it a little bit like a design exercise. So we would give them a case of someone who had a problem, maybe an eye operation or something, so they would need to change their home and adapt it. And they would get the home and, and they would have to make the adaptations for the other person. Uh, here we were testing two versions. So we had a, the kind of the desktop one, where you would have like the thing printed and they could just work there. And with these guys, we wanted to like make a 3D cardboard model of it. In our minds, with the 3D cardboard, it was going to be so great because they would be exercising to just put it. And at the same time, you would really feel where you can get trapped or where there can be a problem. But it took them so long to create the model that then they wouldn't have time to reflect on it. While it's on the table, they started like having all this conversation and they immediately like, were able to produce like 90, 95% of the advice that trainers were formerly giving them. And even having the conversation and thinking, oh, that, that's pretty handy, and I can do this at my own home. So we wiped out the rejection and had them like work on that. And just, I'm gonna again focus on two of the trades because otherwise it gets really. So this is, this is the way we did it. So we have fun and do something that it doesn't feel like a menace and and at the same time, it lets you reflect on it. So it wasn't a problem when you just took it out. When you took it out, and and at the same time, as I said, the trainers they weren't following the manual. So we decided to give the trainers the like value them as trainers and consider that they were intelligent people, and they could make their own decisions. But they needed to instead of telling them exactly what to do in the class, we would like train them in the values of the course. So our idea was like, okay, I'll give you the course structure, basic thing, and I'm gonna tell you exactly e each exercise, why is it here? So if you know another exercise that you prefer for some reason, and, and, you, and it serves for the same purpose, you can change it, as long as it's gonna be for the same purpose. Uh, or if, I don't know, today we're going out of the street and it's raining, maybe you don't want to do it today. You can either do an uh, option to do this in class or you could just change the day and reschedule the going out for another day in the course. So we were giving them all of those alternatives and we created a whole flexible manual for that. And then we trained the trainers very lightly because yeah, they already were creating the course with us and we gave them this very flexible manual that they could use and, and decide. And with this, we made a pilot in three different social contexts and in the city of two months of testing, iterating the whole thing. Uh, sometimes it was crazy because we would be like, because we had three centers that were doing this practically in the same days of the week. So when we saw that some of the things weren't working well in the first <coughs> location, we were just changing them for, for the other two. And, and then, well, it's important always to understand that even though it's been co-created and everyone has had the chance to like give their input, it doesn't need to work as intended because many reasons. And so always test things and one of the things that happened 
was that everything was working really well at the end, but the social foundation, they thought that this flexible manual was too flexible and they felt that they weren't being in control. So in the end, we had to review the whole course, rewrite the manual so it wouldn't be as flexible. And yeah, and prepare all the final versions for everything, the board games, the music and everything. But this rewriting of the manual is also interesting to understand that the, in a way, the only non, the only person that wasn't in the whole co-creation process was the manager of the, f of the aging, aging branch of the foundation. And and she didn't she didn't want to feel not in control, so we had to re change it all around. And the pro the program was uh, scaled to 600 centers. It's been scaled because it's uh, still ongoing, and also it's been sold to a lot of like municipalities and local governments that want to promote health and their um, senior citizens. And that's it. And maybe Mark will take on from here. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, well, do you have any questions about the case as we are leaving it? Yeah, I'm, I'm super intrigued by the work that you've shown. This is very exciting. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I, yeah, my question is about um, what were some of the challenges in co-design and like the opportunity, but also on the flip side, what are some of the opportunities that you found that you wouldn't have found if you gone in with more of a top-down, like, we'll decide what's best for you. Mm. So, I mean, the, managing the complexity of co-design yeah. with multiple stakeholders that have different perspectives and different interests yeah. it seems very challenging. I think probably we, we could have just written a manual like the experts used to do, but for us it wasn't, I think it would have been like all the other manuals that they were very focused on what is the content that these guys need to like learn. And instead of that, like having, for example, the elderly people was key to understanding how they wanted to receive this information or how they wanted to interact with this information. And also it was key to have the trainers, for example, to solve all of this about what is the role of the trainer and why do they, yeah, why do they have to be training something that is not designed by them, that it has to be always the same, or how do we give them this flexibility? Just to stick on a couple of things that I have mentioned before. But I think like all of it, it was integ integral to the project. I wouldn't know how to do it in another way. But yeah. Um, you said the program is being scaled to 600 new centers, which is amazing. Um, you take into account um, as you were doing your research that you were not only research or were you at that point considering that it could be scaled up and how did you take into account that it might not just be the wants and needs of the people in the room but a really yeah. broad and unknown population so uh we always knew that it was going to be scaled if it if it wasn't a disaster because the, the foundation has 600 centers. So their idea is to create something that is going to be present everywhere or in most of the centers. But we, about taking into account the other guys need that, were, that weren't in the room, this is why we did the pilots, because the pilots were done with completely different guys. So no, nobody that was involved or no location that was involved uh, during the design was part of the pilots. And then of course, uh, during the first year of running it, they take very much into account all the uh, evaluation of the program throughout the 600 centers. But we couldn't just, um, we didn't know how to put it into the core design part. But if you have a suggestion. So you said that you guys tested this concept for two months. So what were the parameters that you guys decided to test it on? Like, were there more qualitative parameters or quantitative parameters? Uh, it was more qualitative because it was just in three centers. So we could just go there. We went there and observed every session uh, in all three centers. So different researchers <laughs> would go. And, and also we worked very closely with the trainers in those centers 
because for them it was a well it was a nightmare because it was it was like being i don't know like an actor in a series that the script is changing constantly and you have to go there and perform because we were like constantly saying no 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 we want you to test this or now we yeah but it was more that and then the quantitative data comes from the scaling yeah so the trainers were give you a little pushback because they already knew how to train and you're challenging that in the course of, of opening it up to actual seniors with the trainers did you find that the actual content that they that the seniors out of this process came new ways of training the same things or was it new things to train in other words did the did the did the trainers manual did their prescriptive work yeah. change utterly or was it simply a new way of presenting their existing recipe both things so Can you give there us were an example of one thing yeah uh, so there were like both in in terms of there were there was new content that was provided by the experts and so there was con like the course didn't exist before so we created the content like i don't know exercises specific exercises for uh avoiding or um pushing back sarcopenia and but the on the other side we noticed that the trainers basically they were able to be people who were there were two types so some some of the guys were like really good at, at conducting physical exercise like being a, a trainer of uh, gymnastics and they would be like counting and telling and and again telling uh, giving names to the exercises and things like that and some of the other guys were more like theory based but and we wanted to keep those two qualities, but we also wanted them to be able to facilitate a workshop on how to change somebody Ill, somebody's house. So these were things that they didn't know how to do because they weren't they were never trained for that. So the manual did include all these other abilities to I don't know facilitate a discussion or facilitate a, d a mini design process. Uh, the they had never done before. Does this answer your question? Can you give one example of something that were that was new information that the trainers went away with that didn't exist in the manual before? Well, there wasn't a manual before. So there were manuals for other programs. But yeah, but so all the manual was new to them. Uh, so basically, for example, there was all of this of our how to look all the exercises were created so they would use the manual to know how to conduct the exercise but also one of the things that we did is we noticed as we did all the sessions that icebreakers and things that we used for for uh, workshops were working really well for our participants in our workshops and they suddenly they started being because they were laughing together and they were doing silly stuff together with us beyond designing and this worked really well and it generated a, an instant trust between the different participants so we wanted to like put this into the course too for example because we wanted to generate a sense of community and we wanted to have one of the reasons why you would go to these classes is because the classes are interesting but the other and biggest one is because uh, you you have new friends there so one day you're not feeling really well but and it's raining and it's like yeah do i really want to go to do this gym class but if i have these friends maybe i wouldn't go for myself but i would go for my friends so one of the things that we did from the beginning was to have the course integrate all of these little practices and games that would generate more trust among participants and more interaction among them so they would generate more friendships and this is one of the things that they had never done before and other things for example were uh, in terms of that we were also thinking about because it's great that you go to this class the class has uh, 16 16 classes so the course has 16 classes, but after these 16 classes, 
you're left there and you either go back to the normal gym or you continue on yourself. So one of the things that we were like all the time taking care of was how do you keep this small community that formed and how do you make them continue to do the exercises when the trainer has left? So one of the things that we created to more like towards the end of the course was this process of leaving and leaving something behind and and making sure that the trainer was a little bit like disappearing, vanishing into the background, but the old people would, like the participants would still uh, be there. And, and maybe one day the trainer doesn't come, but we still come here Tuesday and Thursday and mm -hmm. continue exercising together. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So when you said that you scale, you're scaling it to 600 different centers, uh, is it something like this manual gets adapted exactly the same way at every center or were there scenarios where certain things of the manual didn't work because of maybe the culture difference? Yeah, we had to take into account all the pot potential differences. So we did manage to make a flexible <coughs> manual, only not as flexible as we thought. So for many of the things, we would give uh, it like an alternative or like, for example, some of the exercises were done in the street. There are, there are places where you can go and do the exercise in the street, but there are certain neighborhoods where it's simply not nice because there's a lot of cars passing or this whatever. And because this is very neighborhood based, uh, then we would like, for example, the class for training for not falling in the street was in the street. But if you can't do it in the street, or if it's raining, or if it's cold in the winter, then you have an alternative in class, or things like that. Yeah, I think yeah. we have to carry on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Go ahead. Okay. So, yeah. So, just to give a little frame, as I said, it's going to be the tiny pill of theory that we give to guys that commission these things. Uh, yeah, it's more than it's for giving you our point of view on how to on how we approach the project. So it's going to be a glimpse, no? Yeah, glimpse. Okay. Yes, so yeah. basically, uh, we noticed that uh, one of the things that happens is that all the managers and everyone that is around us thinks in terms of very product centric. Um, probably this is things that you guys know, but but they have like this uh, in mind. So they think about a service in terms of also a product. Like you go to buy a car and before you can buy the car there's somebody that provided like car pieces and then you put them together in a factory there is a warehouse where you store the car until it's bought in a shop and and then you, you well no, it's, it's a, a cor there's a curve here oh, yeah, that you yeah. guys <laughs> don't see but it's a bit value light, but of, the a curve, yeah. of the product uh, comes up 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 until you uh, are in the shop and then you go ahead exchange it for money this is called value in exchange and then these guys just rethinks and he has driven his car like two meters and he just thinks that maybe i shouldn't buy the, this car and he tries to sell it second hand and it's like uh suddenly the value drops in half and he can only sell uh, sell it half price so in a way what we are what is behind this is that the value is created by the company and the customers destroy it so this is uh, behind a lot of the things that, that, that are in general management theory and, and throughout. Go ahead. So does it Sounds you familiar, the value chain? Yeah. yeah? No? Okay. So one of the things that happen when you are working with services is that your clients have this point of view, but you are thinking about this. You're thinking about value co-creation. You're thinking that maybe you are someone who goes to the doctor and in order to create something together you have to explain your symptoms and you have to have a conversation and all this process of um, healing or, or getting a service happens in the interactions. Uh, this is called value in use and it happens in the interactions and beyond. So to frame this in the bigger picture you have the interaction here and here we have the lady that goes to the doctor but in this case the doctor commissions i don't know a blood test and the hospital sends it to a laboratory and there they analyze the blood and then she comes back 
and she gets a prescription and in her own time, in her own sphere, without any interaction with the hospital, she has to go to a pharmacy and have this prescription made and she has to take the pills at the proper times and settings. And but there is this is by the way co production of a service. But uh, what happens afterwards is that in fact if she's uh, and, and uh, a senior lady like the ones in, her, in the case before, she most probably doesn't want to feel just to feel better. It's okay. She wants to feel better, of course, but she mainly has this big thing in mind of avoiding to depend on her family, of not becoming a burden to her family. And also the other thing that she wants to do is to continue uh, with her life, continue doing the things that she likes. If she goes to have a coffee with a friend once a week or if she goes to the cinema, then she wants to continue doing that. So these are the real values of why you want to heal yourself and why you go to the doctor in the first place. And this is called value in, con in context. And uh, so basically what happens is that most of the organizations, even the ones that are doing services, and when we work with them, they're like fix, very fixed on this production side, uh, then some of them do have the interaction in mind. By the way, they normally call this the product or something, and, and this is what they consider the service. And, but they forget about this independent side of value. And because it's kind of elusive and difficult to measure and difficult to know what it's about. But what theory says is that real value is created here or here, but here it's only potential value. So it's kind of, if we are fixating on that, we are forgetting uh, a lot of the picture. And yeah, this is service dominant logic or service logic, but maybe you can go through and maybe you can, yeah, but you probably have seen this before. Do you study service domain logic? Does it sound familiar? Okay, yeah, basically no. the <laughs> idea is that uh, value is not delivered by the organization but co-created with the customers and unless uh, there is a customer to use something and then to, to create value around something by, by using this resource for their own in their own sphere, there is yeah, uh, not real value created and and this implies that the clients are actively involved in creating value. So, yeah. Yeah, because some people are writing, but okay. Uh, so at this at this point, uh, theory says that uh, design becomes uh, uh, sorry that service becomes an object of design. So, uh, in terms of service design, the approaches, uh, the backgrounds that the, the practitioners and the academics come from are mainly three that you can see on the top of the triangle. It's come the the people are coming and are having a creative design. Uh, uh, yeah, a creative uh, design. They come from design and, and technology, so it's like well, we are all designers. Also, they come from business and management, so it's the people who come with have a, another different perspe perspective that I will sh I will just put together, and of course, social science. So these are the three main three main let's say categories of people who look at service design, and then you can see how when we connect the dots, you can see that for if you are looking uh, a service from the perspective of design and business. It happens what we call service encounter. That is, as you've seen in the uh, spheres, the two spheres was the interaction moment. So it's like when the service ex exists and actually it's where UX or so user experience happens most of the times. And actually that's the point that, well, it's obvious that when you use a service in some, at some moment you interact with the service, okay? But if you look that from the side of business and management and social uh, science, like regarding the ethnography, anthropology, and all this, what you're looking at is and trying to improve is uh, looking at the co creating the system, which involves not only the users, but uh, other companies, other services. So we're, we're talking about how uh, companies, services, and of course, uh, users co-create the service and the system that it's uh, providing the service. I will have one, uh, one example there. From the third side, you will see that there's a social science and design 
<laughs> and this side of the triangle is talking about the social material con uh, configuration. So it's about how it a service can inter interacts and changes or has to do with social uh, and re practices related to organization okay so going back to the to the three sites if we talk about experience and it's a way to zoom in and what happens in the service because we're talking at, uh, about the particular moments that in, uh, that happen during the service and has to do with get closer to the user and understand what they need in terms of this moment of the service and the several moments of the service, but it has to do with how do I we understand users in the service, okay? So we're going to be focusing in individual uh, interactions, okay? So it's about which channels are uh, users using and how are they using and how we improve this experience through uh, the, the touch points or the moment of use, okay? This is what is most known and most frequently used by all the companies, services, public services, because it's again, it's what I was telling you, it's about user experience. So we designers know really well how to do all this, okay? If you look at the how to create value at this site, it's a way to zoom out on the service because we not we are not going to care only about the users that are here, that are the, the, the guys that are using the service, but all the systems that are around the service or in within in the service to produce the service, which is like about the airline, but also like the ground forces that refuel the plane, the airport itself, and all the services that are around to make possible the service and of course the experience of the user, so it's a way to understand what happens in terms of systems and ecosystems. Uh, so it's more operational, so it's really looking and how it, everything happens, okay? And of course, it depends on how the services interact, the, the service is going to be created in a way or in another way, and it could be, let's say, working better or worse, okay? Uh, and the third side of the triangle, there's the social material, uh, actually has to do with how a service or something that we're designing interacts with uh, the environment and it really it's how, uh, let's say, I don't know, how the things we design can modify it, uh, the social practices and many other things that have to do with the not only the society but how all the things that has to do with the culture. So I don't know. I don't know, for the elderly ones here, like me, I don't know if you remember, at least in Europe, in the concerts, we were like lighting lighters to show that we love one song, and I don't know, the romantic ones, but it has changed already. So everyone is with a mobile phone, not only when, at the moment, the lighting, the, the, the flash of the, of the phone, but actually, I don't know, recording everything and seeing and enjoying the concert through the, through the smartphone. So, I don't know, in... That's more or less the thing of uh, the glimpse of theory. Uh, uh, and, yeah. and yeah, and the final slide is about uh, the case that it has presented to you that it's actually looking at the three sides of the of the triangle. So we take, of course, in care the thing about related to the service encounter, the moment of doing the activity, and so on. How the service was co-created among the all the stakeholders that were providing the service, and of course. Uh, the the side related to how this yeah. can improve people's lives in terms of avoiding them to fall and so on. Yeah, no? well, it was more like the service encounter is all of the activity, but also the co-creating system is all about how to how we put all the organizational side to it and all the manual and all that part, like making sure that this is operational. And then the social material configuration, you can reflect it by the way it was created and also uh, by how we looked not only at the service but the bigger experience of aging and 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 how this can impact on it and this is it yeah just no 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 I should you want to no oh my goodness. this shouldn't be here oh my goodness <laughs> yep. I think we well yep. I think we're okay <laughs> nobody's seen anything no yeah okay I think yeah Thank you. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, 10 to 15 minutes um, for questions. So, uh, I know they already answered a few, but there are, are there additional questions? Andrew? 
I have a question, maybe in, maybe particularly about the case you showed in the first half, or about your general approach to service design, but in particular with the like socio material lens and configuration. How do you deal with the situation in which you encounter a problem and the solution is kind of outside of the scope or the range? And, and, and what do you do in that? So when maybe the, the definition of the scope of the problem is here, as defined by the organization, but the solution lies way outside of that domain. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, as well as we can. <laughs> but uh, I think it would happen almost in every project that you're given a brief or something. And in particular in this project, I remember the client saying, you guys can be as much out of the box as you want, but within the course. So it's kind of saying, but within the box. <laughs> and we came back from the research with lots of insights and things that were out of the scope. And we did give them to them and we did tell this is important. And one example, for example, is how the trainers are normally trained only online. And from our point of view, training the trainers only online, so having them like remember like by heart the manual and then do a test about this and then you're ready because you know the content it's not working for this kind of course because as somebody uh, asked before what is the difference they not only got content they got uh, all these new skills that they had to be trained uh, but we couldn't we couldn't bend the client in a way and they decided that they would still train it the same way Actually, they did do one training, but only on the ex on the physical exercise, and it was like, like, like for the whole for the scaling part, for the non-scaling, for the guys that we were doing the pilot with, we did all the training that we thought. But then, when they wanted to scale, they decided that, yeah, maybe it was needed, but they were not not going to do it. And this is just an example, but there are always things that are out of the scope and. Sometimes you manage, and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. If I can ask a theory question, since you're showing theory, I was just wondering, like, how does your work, are, are you guys familiar with uh, Majid Iqbal? Yeah. Uh, how does he's your- a, he's, He was here in this university, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, I, I had a lot of exchanges with him. He had this, new way of thinking of services. Um, and, I, and he put out a book, and I was just wondering like, how similar and how different? Is there any overlap, or are these two completely different? Uh, well, to be honest, I'm in the middle of reading his book. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the beginning, it was like, oh, this is like really interesting. But then at some point, it, for me, got a little like, arcane. And so it was like, maybe I need to just put it aside and come back. Uh, but I think, I think well, one of the things that is really interesting about what he says is that experience is not enough, and this for sure, I agree hundred percent, or we agree hundred percent. But uh, but then on the on how he approaches the design, I I have to still understand it better. But I'm sure I, th I think it's super promising and and very interesting this approach. I just don't know how to apply it. I'm in the same place. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess, like, how many designers or how many people were on your team and what kind of, like, qualities in putting together a team were you looking at? Okay, so here, yeah, there was uh, Sofia, Lara, and you, and at times, and then Ines, and... And then there was John sometimes. Yeah. So basically, there was there was one um, ethnographer or anthropologist, and and there were like two main designers. That but one of them was uh, yeah. There were two main designers, and then there was a third that was like more like uh, she was <laughs> doing. In the beginning, she was like more junior, but she, I, I guess she got seniorizing throughout the project, because the project lasted one year and a half. So it was a long time and very intense at times. At some of the times, it was just not going on, because, I don't know, we had to like uh, stop for 
summer or stop for Christmas or things like that. But but when it was on, it was pretty intense. And 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 then we had some help by with Mark and his team when we needed. So yeah. So the question was, uh, what people do with the And what qualities, I guess, in the designers who are looking for? Mm. Well, it's a bit, well, I think it's a very good question, actually. Yeah. Because uh, normally people tend to look for, like, you, I know you have the, the title, it's sort of like service designer or something like that. Actually, we look for, of course, they need, we need someone who knows something related to what we do, like, even if it's a ethnographer or a designer or something like that. Uh, as you as you saw at the very beginning, our profiles are really neat and really it's, it's a value on that. But on top of everything, I think we look for someone who's able to understand the situations that we're looking at. Because as a, let's say as a service designer or whatever you want to call this, you have to be able to look and see beyond what you have, what you are viewing. Because actually you gather all of our information, so you have to be able to really synthesize and understand what does it mean. And what is behind all this? There is actually like calls inside or whatever you want to call it. it. Depends on how you look at this. So you know this kind of like able to see in depth, uh, and I, I dare to say that at the same time you need to be a bit critique because two reasons mainly. One, how to like polish what you see, and it's not like okay, I found out. Oh, I, fa I found the inside. So let's go for that. And I don't know. We are a, little, a bit critique, and then. Uh, what what comes out from the, the work again? It's like okay, how do you understand how you, how you can really sharp the thing to make it really work and not get attached to the thing? And all. So above of everything, uh, it's being like really ha able to see what is going. We have time for maybe one last question. Yeah, back there. Um, so I have a question about once the program is uh, implemented, um, how did how were the impacts measured or the outcomes? Was it attendance or lack like reduced calls? Okay, so this is a very good one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that uh, as and the doctor, the expert that was with us, he wanted to use it for for his own research. And, and we were like including in as part of the program tests on 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 the participants at the beginning at the end, even as a as a way of just like understanding how much progress you made and also like motivating you to continue. But the foundation decided that they didn't want to collect this information. Maybe also because there's some legal issues about keeping records of this information that is health related and it's highly protected in Europe. Uh, but in the end, they decided to stick with just um, satisfaction evaluation, which is for me not as interesting because yes, they were satisfied, but do they really fall less or do they really improve? In, and we already had the tests in, so it was really easy to just keep a track on this. And, but we know that they improve because we know that in all the pilots that we did, all of them improved, or all of the guys who were sticking to the class improved, but we can't say it. Yeah. You know, I was going to say that at the, at the same time, at some point, they, they decided not to share any information about the progress of the world. Yeah. So I don't know if you've been in Spain, but the culture is very different than here. And actually, you find someone in the street that it's related to the project and then tells you, wow, the project is a complete success. We double the people who was doing it and actually works really well everywhere because they are able to adapt anything. But let's see from the... Official information? They, they never wanted to give any feedback because they really got into a... They got scared about, oh, oh, oh this is really going to change. This is how it works in Spain at least. It's like... This means that we have to change the way we're working because this is really bringing better results for everyone, for, for us, for the people who's going into, who's using the service, for the people who are providing the service, for anyone. And actually, it's like wow, they were facing this. This I don't I don't think it's a challenge yet because they so get they got so scared that it's like they try to 
kind of cover over cover the thing and say, okay, it's it's one more thing. So it was really like everyone was completely amazed, like people from outside, uh, well, the, the from the team, but also the, the the people who works in the foundation in the in the same branch were like kind of amazed. So yeah, it's kind of okay. Uh, <laughs> who knows the the, the KPIs about that? Yeah. Thank you so much. No, thank you.